go the official name that we would call him. Um, and his topic is on the effects of commercial games on motivation and learning outcomes. And it's all yours, Elsie. All right. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, I appreciate uh, you guys. I know you have different groups, so I appreciate you being here. Um, as Dan introduced me, my name is Lautaro Cabrera. I go by LC. And I'm going to talk to you today about the effects of commercial games in the classroom um, on learning outcomes and motivation. So the first thing I would like to do is introduce the term of commercial games. Um, sometimes they're referred to as commercial off-the-shelf games. These are games that are designed specifically, specifically for entertainment, so they don't have an educational goal by the developers. These games, uh, don't be thrown off by the wording off the shelf, they can be acquired digitally today, you can download them, that's not a problem. I'm just talking about commercial games in general. And some examples are The Sims or SimCity, Civilization, games like Minecraft that are getting very popular lately. So my two research questions are very similar. The first one is, when a commercial off-the-shelf game is introduced into a middle or high school classroom, what kind of learning outcomes do we see? And the second one is very similar, but instead of learning outcomes, what type of motivational outcomes do we see? Now, in the methodology, um, I will normally give you a lot more uh, information about this part, but today I do want to focus on the uh, results. So I'll just briefly tell you that I did a systematic search, looking for empirical sources that implemented a game into a classroom. Um, I used the main databases and some keywords, and I did two different waves of analysis. The first one was based on an annotated bibliography that allowed me to look at patterns and trends across the different sources. And the second one had to do with something called the arts model, which I'll explain in a little bit, um, and that one was particular to motivation. So after doing my search, um, I ended up with 26 sources, and I want to talk about those sources a little bit as a group in general. The first thing is that they were mostly qualitative. Only six of those contained some quantitative data. Um, secondly, they were all peer reviewed and they were all empirical articles. Sorry, they were mostly empirical articles and they had some book chapters in there and they had some proceedings as well. However, and I think more importantly, as a group, this literature as well had some uh, strong methodological concerns. The first is that nine of those 26 articles had an over reliance on teacher anecdotal evidence. Uh, so there were the conclusions were loosely based on random observations, on some quotes that they were not ex explicitly defined on how they acquired those uh, pieces of information. The second one was a weak or no description of how the analysis was conducted. So a lot of times they would say things like, we had interviews, we had observations, we had documents, but they didn't say how they analyzed those, what kind of coding did you do, what kind of interpretation did you do of that information. And lastly, there was um, a lot of times not an acknowledgement of potential biases, and because of that, not any countermeasures to fight those. So uh, when the teacher or the researcher played a significant role in that classroom, there was not an acknowledgement that that could influence how they view those results. So let's move on to the results. Um, first, talking about learning outcomes. When you look at the literature as a whole, uh, there were mostly positive effects on specific skills, and those were higher order thinking skills. So I'll give you three examples. In critical thinking, uh, nine of, of the uh, articles that I looked at expressed some way of critical thinking as a benefit of using these games. Um, and I can give you examples later. Um, the other two were, one of them was problem solving. So eight of those articles also show some way of problem solving. And this is common in most games, where most games have some way of requiring you to solve a problem for you to reach the next level or have some sort of goal within the game. And then lastly, creativity. Um, in creativity, some of the games were used as a way for students to express their creativity, as opposed to more traditional ways, such as writing a story. Um, however, these results that I just explained have some nuances. And um, these are important because they relate to the characterization of the literature base that I just talked about and those methodological concerns. The first is that there was a lack of clarity on the measurement of those outcomes. A lot of times the authors would say, students show creativity, or students show problem solving. But they wouldn't define those concepts, and they wouldn't allow us to see if that evidence they provided matched those definitions. The second one was that there were differences within, within each classroom, so the effects were not universal. Those learning outcomes I just talked about, a lot of times were for a particular type of students or a group of students, and there were other groups of students that did not benefit as much from the same intervention. In terms of motivation, um, there was a similar overall positive effect. Um, 21 of the 26 sources mentioned a positive effect on uh, motivation, and I use the word mentioned on purpose for some issues that I'll discuss in a minute. 
um, that were also not universal. There were specific cases and types of students that motivated were motivated more by the use of games than others. I won't go into detail uh, because of time on these three, but males seem to be more motivated by games, disadvantaged learners seem to be more motivated by games, and finally the level of scaffolding or the level of interference in the game experience seem to also affect how much motivational um, how much of a motivational boost do you get from that? So some of the issues there were, again, an over-reliance on anecdotal evidence, and once again, a lack of definition of what motivation was, uh, and how did they, um, the authors uh, define motivation to see it in the evidence. So in order to counter these, I performed uh, an additional analysis, and this one is based on the ARCS model, which is developed by Keller. Um, the the ARCS is for attention, relevance, confidence, and satisfaction. Um, and Keller also provided two instruments to measure these four sub-constructs and motivation as a whole. So looking at that model, what it did was I looked at each of the 26 sources and each statement in those sources that had to do with motivation, I, I wrote it on a post-it and then I categorized it according to those four um, attention, relevance, confidence, and satisfaction. So if it related to the definition of one of those concepts or if it responded to one of the questions in the instruments, that we're scoring those concepts, then it went for that uh, particular construct. So an example, if I read, the students really enjoy the game, then that would go into satisfaction because it really, um, it closely resembles a uh, response to number 16 in one of the instruments, I enjoy working for this course. So these two are related. This is what it looked like. Uh, this is just a picture of what, uh, what my wall looked like. Um, and these are the results, and I'm going to zoom into them so you can see them a little better, but as you can see, most of these statements made were in three of the four categories. So that's attention, satisfaction, and relevance. In terms of attention, um, you see a wide range of uh, different subconstructs, but the biggest one is interest. And I want to note that this negative part will be in each of the four. That means that there was a negative statement about attention. So if a teacher said uh, this, this student did not pay as much attention or didn't pay attention, that will, go in, that will count as a negative. In terms of confidence, teachers and researchers, the authors usually mention the word confidence itself. So they would say things like, Mike became a really confident reader while playing the game. In terms of relevance, the biggest sort of subconstruct was that of hard working. I know that doesn't sound exactly like relevance, but it is um, responding to one of the questions in those instruments that were developed by Keller. Finally, in terms of satisfaction, um, the biggest one is enjoyment. I know you can't see much of this preference, negative, and then fun. So enjoyment was by, uh, by a lot was the largest one uh, that we saw there. So this so what question. Um, if you're an educator and you look at this literature, I would say that colleagues, so other teachers and researchers who implement these games, suggest that commercial games implementations are most effective in specific cases. One, when you're trying to promote higher order thinking skills, because of that, those are the specific kinds of skills that we saw benefit the most in these implementations. Number two, to increase student motivation, but again in specific types. So first, in terms of attention, relevance, and satisfaction. And secondly, in males, disadvantaged learners, and when you don't interfere too much on the game experience. So um, I want to talk a little bit about the limitations, because first of all, we had the methodological concerns that I talked about at the beginning. Those obviously have to qualify our conclusions, and the conclusions I just talked about, um, we have to think about them as the perspective of teachers and the researchers who wrote that, because the, the data was not systematically collected or analyzed in most of the studies. Secondly, the ARCS model analysis that I performed was based on observations, as I just said, so from teachers and researchers, but the instruments were actually developed for self-report, so there may be a little bit of a jump there from what the students would self-report if they could and what the teachers and researchers actually saw. And finally, that the review did not include any longer sources like dissertations or books, because again, this was a semester project, so I wanted to make sure I could dive uh, in detail into that. Okay, so some future directions. Um, the qualitative nature of the literature was not a problem. That's, that's not an issue. The problem was that there was a lack of rigor conducting those. Um, so I understand that higher order thinking skills are hard to measure quantitatively, so we can stay with qualitative data, but they has to be um, in a rigorous way that can actually show these relationships we're trying to make. And finally, um, we also need to assess the perspective of the students in terms of motivation. A lot of these studies had to do with how the teachers saw the students motivated, but not how the students reported themselves feeling motivated. All right, and that's my next.
the spirit. And I get, as I said, we'll do questions after the fourth presentation.